What's up, sweaties? It's episode 76 of Collider Heroes. I'm John Schnepp, and we are bringing the whole world of heroes and villains to you, television, movies, and comic books. Let's get started. We got a great panel with us. Over here, we got Robert Meyer Burnett. What's up, man? Well, hello. Good to be here once again. Television movies. That's right. Crazy. Wow. Um, and and right off the top, David Griffin finally appearing on Collider Heroes. We got a, he's a sweaty who's been on TV talk for <laughs> almost the entire run, and I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. I've loved this show. I've been a fan of this show. I've talked about superheroes on TV talk and Flash Recap Show and all that, and I'm excited to finally talk about some heroes with you. Hell yeah. Let's get started. We're going to start right off the bat with a countdown to Superman on the brand new season of Supergirl. That's right. Superman looks to have a heavy presence in the season opener to Supergirl, and they named they named Name check Gotham, and you see a ton of Clark Kent rocking out, talking to Perry White. Uh, now with Supergirl flashpointed into the CW Superverse, can Batman be far behind? Let's talk about Superman in Supergirl. Now, Robert, we were just talking about this before we started the show, and we're talking a little bit about the flavor of seeing Clark Kent, the real Clark Kent, an accurate portrayal of Clark Kent. And is Superman going to overshadow Supergirl in her own series? Well, there's a couple things that, that I noticed in, in the trailers. They showed a couple trailers of Superman that I loved. And the first and foremost being, and everyone wondered, will Superman overshadow Supergirl? But I love the moment when the, when the shuttle is going down, the space shuttle or whatever mm -hmm. that craft is, and Supergirl's already there. Superman shows up and says, hey, do you need a help? Do you need a hand? And he's not even doing anything. He's just hovering next can to I, her. Can yeah. I help you out? You know, right. and, and not like he wants to overshadow her. He asks permission. He's a gentleman. And then she goes, sure. And they both apparently fly the shuttle into safety, right. which I thought was exactly the tone that the show should hit. And, I, I, I and, agree. He, and Superman was right there. I mean, I'll tell you something else that I, that I really loved when he's talking to Perry White on the phone. And he's like, well, you use Great Caesar's Ghost. You know, that's kind of an anachronism. <laughs> right. I'm like, I'm, I'm so in. Berlanti and his crew have right. once again nailed it. I can't wait. I agree. I mean, hearing that, hearing him talking to great uh, to a Perry White and a Great Caesar's Ghost, and even like, being, I know the no, I'm not talking about you. Like, just so you could hear. I can't wait to see who is going to play Perry White because right now I am dying for a Superman series. Never thought I'd say that from seeing 15 seconds of Superman as Clark Kent, but literally uh, Tyler uh, Ho Ho Hoechlin. How Hoechlin, do you say his Hoechlin, name? Hoechlin, 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 and Superman, and I'm sold. Like, you know, we first saw the costume, we're like, ah, they're doing that kind of like weird, almost like a strange, like uh, cape design and stuff like that, but it doesn't matter. This guy's Superman, and he's like a pretty cool Superman. What are your thoughts? I, I think CW is using this as a testing ground to see if Superman <coughs> holds up, if people, if the demand is there, if he's going to get his own spinoff show. What I love about the CW is they don't seem afraid to really embrace the comic book nature of what they're doing. I mean, obviously they're doing comic book characters, but sometimes you can kind of hide behind it, you know, make it a little more streamlined. I feel like uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has done that at some points, but I feel like the CW, especially with The Flash mm -hmm. and Legends of Tomorrow, has really embraced their being comic book characters and being crazy and over the top. And I don't think that Superman's going to overshadow Supergirl. The whole, I mean, Robert, behind you, that picture of Doctor Strange and the whole Avengers team. I mean, right. the whole thing about comic books is team ups. You have totally. to help each other out, no matter if you're a demigod or you're Haw Hawkeye. Right. You know, it's like you, you have to help each other out. So I think definitely that. I think they're going to work well together. I, I don't know how many episodes he's going to be in. I don't think he's going to be in every single episode. Right. So, I mean, she's going to be able to stand on her own, and I hope the show grows and matures a little bit from where it was on CBS. I think it definitely will. And, I mean, I know uh, Superman is slated for the first two episodes and then right. a couple later in the season, mm -hmm. but um, you're right. It's, it's really great to see, and that's why I'm really glad that uh, Supergirl has left CBS and joined the CW universe because – it, that's the world of DC on television, and that's mm -hmm. every everybody has their own city and their own area and all their own super villains, and it's really cool to see them team up. And it would be great to see Superman and the Flash actually do that race Don't that we that, could yes. finally see. I know they kind of did it with Supergirl, but I mean, we're we're gonna see things that we never thought we'd see as, as comic book fans, but also all the TV viewers who are not familiar with his entire universe mm -hmm. of comic book characters are gonna see some really cool things. And it's all because the CW is actually trying something that comics have done successfully for decades, and that's the team ups and the crossovers. I mean, outside of Netflix, this is the place to go to watch comic book heroes. Pretty much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on TV. Well, you know, th this is a little, from a, from a filmmaking standpoint, there was something about that clip that I, I really appreciated. Like, obviously, having superheroes fly around, even with our advanced state of special effects, is not cheap. So they have to figure out ways to make the show, they can drop in effects flavor when we need it, 
but they have to make the show look lush. Mm -hmm. And and this is just this is going to seem very strange, but when Clark Kent was on the phone, all of the extras that were surrounding him, there were people crossing the lens, mm -hmm. there were people behind the phone booth. There was a lot of extras. Mm -hmm. And the sec the when you're making a film, it's always this, the uh, the uh, uh, First AD, who usually controls the set totally. and makes the the flow the, the, the flow extras. of the extras and 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 directs the extras, excellent extras directing at least in that scene. Yeah, I believed I was in a sprawling metropolis. Right, I believed. I mean, it's just a guy on the phone, but it's those little things collectively mm. that uh, is allows you to suspend your disbelief and believe. Yes, I'm in Metropolis. Yeah, you know, for sure. I thought that was really cool. I agree. That's, no one looked into the camera. Yeah, it was well, like, right. Yeah, that was. Uh, but to have a lot of extras like that shows that okay, while you might not be able to make a hundred million dollar movie, there's ways that you can make your show look lavish. Definitely. So kudos oh. to them. Um, I agree. So we can't wait for uh, Supergirl to premiere. And uh, uh, up oh. next, oh, what's oh, I'm sorry, can we just address real quick? I just want yeah. to know uh, get a schedule here. But talk about can Batman be far behind? Was one of the questions. Oh, you sure, had. sure. And I, I don't think we're ever going to see. Not ever, but at least in the next couple of years, Batman in his full suit being Batman. But I still don't understand why Bruce Wayne can't show up at one of Oliver mm -hmm. Queen's parties and be like, hey, I'm Bruce Wayne. And like, just, just in a suit. He doesn't have to be in his costume. I don't know why. I, I wish we could see that. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, we almost forgot that part. Mm -hmm. Can Batman be far behind? I think Batman is going to come to the CW. It's not going to be this year. It's not going to be next year. It's not going to be in mm -hmm. three years. We have to wait for Gotham to end. Mm -hmm. And is when will that end they're in their third season right now um i actually watched the third season you know the last two, two episodes yeah, yeah. and just can't get into it sorry i yeah, just don't here. like it and uh you know not hoping you know i don't never want to hope people don't have jobs and stuff but i do hope that they finish their run by season five maybe have their you know final episode with like oh you know into the future and show you know young bruce wayne mm -hmm. as batman or something like that or like when a, I, I don't know how they're gonna do it but i'd like that show to just stop and right. like reboot and get batman into the cw universe because i think what they're doing on the cw is really working i mean right you know i watched like three out of the four shows i mean arrow has got like a little more work to to be to get going to kind of rise back up to be on the par of the other three i think but uh look i mean batman it's like they're mentioning gotham they're not afraid to say look he's part of this universe we're going to weave him in slowly and they don't have the rights forever and i'm sure there's not right. like a we're not going to see a smallville with gotham that's just not going to happen well, I mean, you know, I've always thought that after, especially after <clears throat> Batman v Superman, I've often joked, I'd love to see a Bruce Wayne, Diana Prince show, kind of like a modern heart to heart, mm, where yeah. Bruce Wayne and Diana Prince just travel the world looking for <laughs> artifacts, <laughs> stolen artifacts that they can repatriate to the countries, to the museums that they right. belong to, kind of like a, you know, a rich Indiana Jones. Yeah. Well, what if Bruce Wayne was only Bruce Wayne? Like, we all know he's Batman, mm -hmm. but we only ever see him in his Bruce Wayne guise. Like, he's always <clears throat> he's always doing something. He's always detecting, or he's, mm -hmm. and we know that. Right. But the other characters don't. Like, he could be this guy who walks in and is gathering all this information for maybe a big, like, who knows? He's he's Brother Eye. You know, he's or he's, se he's setting up the Justice League on television. Right. Like you, That'd you, be cool. You could, set, you could have Bruce Wayne in, in different outfits for two seasons showing up collecting intel on every single character from the CW. Or have just Ben Affleck. Come <laughs> Friday. Oh, yeah. That'd be too weird. I know, I Can't know. cross the streams yet. <laughs> the streams haven't been built. So talking about crossing streams, Doctor Strange mm -hmm. is crossing streams into the Avengers Infinity War, and it's finally official. It's not like we didn't know this for like the last like six months, but finally it's an official thing. Now, we just saw an incredible spot drop last couple days uh, showcasing some more of the trippy visuals, seeing a few more scenes of like kind of like the upper crusty Stephen Strange mm -hmm. and his transformation into like broken armed, like I need to fix my life, Stephen Strange, and then finally Doctor Strange. Uh, and we saw a little bit more of the humor with the uh, Mr. Doctor uh, lines from Mads Mikkelsen. Yeah. Um, or was it Dr. Mister? I can't remember now. Um, so anyway, it's incredible. Uh, but it's all but confirmed, though, by Benedict Cumberbatch that Dr. Strange will be helping out the Avengers in, the, uh, in their IMAX Infinity War uh, coming out in two years. So he said to Empire Magazine, logistically challenged uh, of logistical challenge of aligning his schedule with those of Robert Downey Jr., Chris Hemsworth, Elizabeth Olsen, and Paul Bettany to get us all together will be quite something. That's why this character is being introduced to open up the next chapter. So watch this space to see how that unfolds. What will Doctor Strange be doing in Infinity War? David, what are your thoughts? Saving the day. And he's going to be also, I loved in this new TV spot that we got to, we heard the line, 
okay, the Avengers, Thor and them, they battle the physical side of things. Mm -hmm. We do the more, I guess, spiritual or whatever you want to call that arena. So right. I think whatever enemy is coming at them is going to be coming. Well, you know, it's I mean Thanos, but whatever that comes at them, it's going to be multiple levels. There's right. going to be the physical and the mystical, and he's going to help battle, I think, the mystical side. Of course, he's going to help with the physical, too, but he's going to be in another realm. We're going to see a whole new dimension of Marvel Cinematic Universe that we haven't seen before, and that's totally. exciting. I know some people are going around saying, like, Cumberbatch is overrated. He's being used too much. I, I, I love him. I can't wait for Sherlock, yeah. you know, to go on a, a TV rant. He's and fantastic. Like, yeah. We're lucky he's to have so him. He's so good. As Doctor and, and, Strange. And I loved at the end of this new TV spot, we got to see the banter between him and Mads Mikkelsen's character. It still feels like that Marvel, you know, flair and I, there. And that, I'm excited to me, for that. feels like Dan Hart. Harmon. I'm like, I'm like, yo, remember they were like, yo, we pulled in Dan Harmon to add a little bit more like comedic flavor just in the dialogue. And that feels like that's Dan Harmon right there. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I could call and be like, yo, Harmon, is that you? But it feels <laughs> like that's Dan Harmon. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I, I <laughs> everything Marvel does, I love. I mean, I sat down and watched uh, the Civil War. There's a really good documentary. It's, it's almost an hour long on the making of Civil War. And one of the interesting things about that was just the airport battle was really basically they brought in all the actors in front of green screen as you might imagine right. but because it's so well uh pre and storyboarded and everyone knows what they're doing they could add anybody next to anybody if they had to and so even scheduling now isn't as much of a problem as cumberbatch might make it out to mm. be but you know i think it's going to be interesting i think that in order to get to thanos the way to get there quickly because the avengers aren't exactly equipped with spaceships right how do you get to thanos to fight him unless mm. he's coming to earth you go through the mystic realm, mm. you know, where you're not constrained by space time. Mm. Right. You know, you don't have to travel light years. You can travel through different planes of existence, different dimensions. You're, you're, you're warping space in a different way than a spaceship might. And I'm thinking maybe, maybe that's the way that they get to him. You know, that, that it, it's, th it's Doctor Strange that leads the way to Thanos. Right. You know, and maybe he's weaker on the mystic plane. Or does mm. does Doctor Strange take Thanos to the de the world the realm of the dead? Right. Is is Hela going to play death? Or maybe she's already there. Right. And that's where Thanos visits, and maybe that's where he's weakest. And that brings yeah. Thor into the mix too yeah. with that side. Of, so I'd like to see him and Thor together too, because they they always seem like in a different plane than everybody else. Well, is. we definitely we know <laughs> that Thor is looking for Doctor Strange because we saw him and Loki in New York with like the you know the Bleecker Street address. We're like <laughs> he's gonna be going to Doctor Strange. <laughs> so we know we already know that's happening. I mean, I just love the fact that the strings are being pulled together. Everything mm -hmm. is being tightened, you know, and and it's just great. I mean. Kevin Feige, the guy, the man is a master of, of orchestrating. What is he again? He's our Lord and Savior. That's right. And by the way, someone said to me that that was an offensive term, that I shouldn't say that. But I mean that with great affection to everyone. And I mean it tongue in cheek, but it's true. It's <laughs> That's true. Right. I just feel safe with and I. I know there's, I'm sure you guys have had this debate tons of times mm -hmm. in the show. It's always the DC versus Marvel. I don't, I don't like the fight. You know I like it. We don't have that debate because it's, we don't have it. We don't, we're both, we enjoy DC yeah, and, and Marvel. It, but so I, there is no versus. But the only thing that it, it, it bothers me sometimes, if you look at my comic book poll list, mm -hmm. it's mostly DC. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm just more of a DC reader. But when I have, when I think of the films, of course, Marvel, I just feel like Kevin Feige has everything. Just like you said, the strings are there. He has everything the way he wants it. And they're confident and they know what they're doing. And I just, I just feel safe. Every time I see a Marvel trailer, I'm like, this is probably going to be a good movie. It might not be the best movie I've ever seen in my life, but this is going to be another enjoyable film. I just have that confidence, and I can't wait to see Doctor Strange, and especially I can't wait to see him in Avengers Infinity War. Well, I think the other cool thing that they're showing you with Doctor Strange with that little thing about, like, well, the Avengers do this, but it's basically saying, well, the Avengers are dealing with saving Earth. Right. Doctor Strange is dealing with saving the universe. Right. So it's well, like kind of he's, he's, on he's, got, he's on a different level of big ideas. So Yeah, you know, also I like what you just said because – you know, I've often maintained that they could do an Avengers dinner party movie. I've said it on the show before, where you could just do a two-hour movie with the Avengers at dinner. Mm -hmm. at a, like, we saw that in Age of Ultron. Trying to I pick up Thor's hammer. <laughs> I, I mean, I could have just watched their banter. Like, I, I, you, you show, it's a three-part story. You show the arrival, <laughs> you show the dinner, right. and then you show the, the aftermath. aftermath, where people are having a, a You could do it like cocktails. Clue. Someone dies. Oh, you have no. to figure out who, yeah, who did You know, J.J. <laughs> Abrams did Much Ado About Nothing, where he basically had his friends show up, and they shot in his house for like 15 right, days. Mm -hmm. Do that for the Avengers. Well, yes, but you <laughs> couldn't do that with the DC characters. Like, I don't believe Bruce Wayne, Diana Prince, and Clark Kent are going to hang out and make a two-hour movie. Not yet. Not yet, but Not I don't yet. know if they ever will because they're, they're large. I've been a DC kid since I was— They're gods. They're gods. Yeah. You know, you know what, they though? don't hang out and have dinner. You're like, going to see them hang out in Justice League. I guarantee you that they're going to humanize them a little They've bit. They've done they it in the animated just... verse. 
Right. I remember, like, there was a great one of the Justice League. I'm sorry to get off topic. One of the Justice League animated episodes. I remember That's it was, uh, it, was it, it was Di- Di- good. It was Diana and and Bruce and well, they were in character, of course, and they were out patrolling. And then I think Diana was like, "So do you want to like go out sometime?" And then he was like, "You you don't want to get mixed up with a guy like me. Like I have issues, basically." <laughs> <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> it, was like, it was so good. But yeah, I mean, I I could see that. I and watching, I I'm obsessed with Batman v Superman. The ultimate cut. Mm-hmm. I yeah. keep watching it, and I keep watching it because there's something spellbinding about the overall tone. Now that they fix these these jerky jerky editorial problems, right. there's something mythic about that movie. We can there talk is. about it later. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and that's and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah. I know there's a lot of people out there who are like you know like me hated the theatrical cut, but then somehow see the the uh, ultimate cut and it's a different movie yeah. and people are like what's the extra 30 minutes how did that make it a different movie it's it's not just 30 minutes randomly like added at the end or beginning it's intercut throughout the entire movie scenes are completely moved around and mm-hmm. changed around so well, the overall show- tone is what you're talking about it it works even showing a, a large body of water between gotham and metropolis you know they have this big right. bay like i'm like okay it's not just a bridge you know you know, right. it's it's a large right. like I believe that it's across it's, it's Oakland Staten and, Island. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like you know it's Oakland and San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and I believe that. And throughout the movie, but there's a feel to it. I mean, a lot of people bag on Zack Snyder, but he's got a way of he does know how to do something lyrical with his imagery. Yes, and Watchmen is beautiful. I love just looking <clears throat> at that film. It, he just missed the point of the story in there a little bit. Yeah, it, but, bit, yeah. but I think look, I think Doctor Strange joining the Avengers mm-hmm. and joining Infinity War. I think this could perhaps be. I don't even know if I'm going to get through Infinity War. I think my head literally might explode. <laughs> it's too much. Just people are passing uh, out. I mean, another sweat. comic book nerd is being gurneyed out. <laughs> I mean, I need an IV drip of just water. So much sweat right. is going to be pouring <laughs> out of my body. I'm, I'm bringing like four liters of just water. I, mean, we, I, I can't water. even imagine what it would be like. It'd be like. It'd be like if somebody put Star Wars and Star Trek together. I mean, I, I don't know. Insanity. I it's insanity. All right, let's get on to the next insane thing. That's right. Ghost Rider is now in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So the last season was like highlighting a bunch of Inhumans. And all of a sudden, season, uh, this is season four, right? Yeah. Season yeah, four. four of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has Ghost Rider in it. And believe me you when i thought was like i was like what the hell how are they going to introduce ghost rider this seems kind of corny what are they doing have they jumped the shark that's was kind of my attitude about agents of shield and i watched it last night and i'm i'm halfway thinking they jumped the shark and halfway thinking they might have something going on here because i like the way they introduced ghost rider i liked the way they introduced the inhuman that they're chasing now who used to be one of the agents mm-hmm. um I, I can't remember what her name is. What is her uh, name? They call her Quake now. Yeah, Quake. Quake right. Yeah, Quake. Yeah, and I and I and I like their fight. Mm-hmm. I just feel like a lot of the other stuff has to go. And it feels like the other stuff is filler now. I'm like, if you're introducing a character as strong as Ghost Rider, and then you have this new Inhuman who used to be an agent, right. she uh, Quake. Both anytime they were on screen, I was totally invested in. in and unfortunately, all the other stuff was kind of felt like filler, and I just. And granted, I didn't watch season three, so there were a lot of Mm -hmm. characters who I didn't know. I was like, why is this person reacting this way? Or it's obviously some storylines that I need to catch up on. But it made me interested enough to like, you know what? I'm going to watch the next episode, which I've never felt that way about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. before. So what are your guys' thoughts? Let's start with uh, Robert. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I, too, was a little dubious because, you know, it's it's not just it's not just Ghost Rider. It's everything that goes along with Ghost Rider. If Ghost Ghost Rider exists, then A, B, C, and D are also true. And then it's like, okay, you're dealing with a S.H.I.E.L.D. show. And I know, look, in the comics, Ghost Rider interacts with our heroes. (laughs) But you're bringing in a a, a supernatural aspect to it. You're bringing in a very wacky set of circumstances that you add to the idea of of what Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was. Mm And I was like, how is it all going to work now? I've been educated on the show because I did not know the new Ghost Rider from the comics. Right. But thanks to the tutelage of both Amy and Ashley, mm-hmm. I've learned about that Ghost Rider. And I think they did a really good job. From I have not read him in the comics. But I thought they did, like you said, a great job of introducing the character. I'm like, totally. wow, I buy into this now. And I mean, I was up on my Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., so mm-hmm. I, 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 I didn't feel it was as much filler as you did. But okay. suddenly, I'm like, I just... That's all I care about now is I just want to see the bring right. on the Ghost Rider show. Yeah, I mean, the stakes got really raised, especially when he was like, oh, are you from hell too? And it's sort of like, 
what hell are they going to be talking about? Well, yeah. Is Mephisto going to be in this? What you know? Is Son of Satan coming up next? What's going on? What are your thoughts? yeah? Because we got that that strange ghost character going around scaring totally. everybody, and then you have. I mean, I got to give credit to uh, his name's uh, Gabriel Luna, and he's so good in the role. I almost want to pull him out of the show, throw him on Netflix, and be like, give him his own. <laughs> right. let, 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 let him mess around right. with with those characters. But I think he makes the show better. I, I left after season one. I watched all of season one, got off, came back to check out uh, Ghost Rider, and I'm I, I'm going to keep watching. I was watching part of uh, episode two before we got on the show today, and I'm going to keep watching. I'm, I'm into it now. But like you said, I think some of the other stuff, like Fitz and Simmons' relationship, and I've never been into those two characters, so I feel like that just doesn't feel important to me. But again, I, to be fair, I haven't seen the other right. seasons, so I'm sure I'm missing a lot of the story. Yeah, and, and you know, actually, I, I heard a weird rumor like John Burnfall might be in yeah. Agents of Shield. Yeah. I think they're that's not that's just a rumor, and it's he's actually shooting Defenders. I don't think right. it'd, be, not, it'd be cool. The show's airing later now, right. and there was a lot of blood splatter if you notice in episode one. So I mean, he could fit. I mean, just for a cameo, I, I, I'd be I'd love it. To if see they him did on that, there. it would be cool. Yeah, <clears throat> I think he's going to be in Infinity War. Burnfall? Really? Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I I think that they are going to have cameos from at least the Netflix characters. They should, and they I should. I agree with you. I mean, I feel like even if they did it like where there's sort of like some giant sonic boom and all the characters from every like they all look What's up. What's going or on? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, they're eating, like Luke Cage eating a sandwich, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like he's hanging out with like you know uh, Danny from Iron Fist. Right. So I would like to see all those characters, like to just show like yes, this is a Marvel Cinematic World. It's television and movies. Hugh know? Jackman. That I'm would be too, you, too crazy. I'm telling you, why not? Yeah, why not is why right. Why not? If he's they not should. playing Wolverine anymore, why can't he just? If Hugh Jackman's in the movie, they can't preclude him from being in it. Ah, uh, dude, that all they have to do is show him. <laughs> that would be crazy. Just show Hugh Jackman just hanging out. <laughs> say, I with Stanley. That. Yeah, yeah I know. Stanley, in a cafe Stanley. or something. Right, right, yeah. in a cafe. That, oh there man, you go. <laughs> the ultimate double cameo. <laughs> that would be crazy. All right, well, let's hope that happens. Um, if it doesn't, uh, we will still see Avengers Infinity War and all the 70,000 other characters who are in it. So uh, let's move on to minor mutations this week. Uh, I'm just going to list off a bunch of them, and then we're going to talk about it. So number one, we've got Deathstroke returns for Arrow's 100th episode. Uh, number two, we've got Tom Holland. He skimps around in uh, some uh, kitty cat under underwear uh, pajamas uh, and some set picks from Spider-Man Homecoming. Also, an amazing amount of really cool shots of him in his Spider-Man suit, practical, pulling off his mask like right out of the comic books. Number three, that's right, we got a Hot Toys release. It's the Netflix oh, Daredevil. Yeah. You know, Robert, when he saw that, he just started salivating. Uh, we got number four, Iron Fist writer Tamara Be Becker goes to Hulu's Runaways. They're already getting that going. Uh, CEO uh, says Ben Affleck's Batman solo film is a year and a half away. Even though they haven't like dropped the date, he's saying it's a year and a half away. So we're talking about probably the end of 2017. It could be that October slot that they're that's still it's not too far away. They rock they lock down as a DC release. That would just simply be amazing. Uh, uh, number six, we got Sam Neely as a small part in Thor Ragnarok. Who could he be playing? Uh, let's start it off, David. What pops out to you? I'm excited about Deathstroke because right. I think Arrow season two was its best season, and uh, I love Manu Bennett uh, ever since I saw him in the Spartacus series on Stars. He's just such a good actor, and I think his presence is needed. Something's needed on that show. A lot of people are saying this might be the comeback season. Uh, I don't know. There's a lot to be. I think Flash, like you said, Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, they've overtaken the series, mm -hmm. that show, so I hope that Arrow is back on track. Um, also, I really like Sam Neill as an actor. Yeah. Uh, I've been watching Peaky Blinders on Netflix lately, and he was in the first season of Peaky Blinders with, with, with um, so uh, Killian Murphy and sure. all those guys, and he's such a good actor. I have no idea who he could play, but I'm excited to see him. Yeah, some people are saying maybe the gardener or something, like gardener. to play along with uh, the Grandmaster. Mm. What are your thoughts on <laughs> Well, you know? I mean, of course, <laughs> of course I have to mention the, the Daredevil Jer hot yeah. toy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, what I love about it is, of course, I keep up on my hot toys. I'm, everyone who tweets me, has Burnett R RM seen this on Twitter? I mean, I get 100,000 tweets yes i've seen it mm -hmm. I, I keep up but again you know people have asked me what what's the deal why do you why are you so obsessed with hot toys and i'm like well you know when i was a little kid you get like the star wars land speeder and it did not look like a land speeder it was too short the windshield was too big mm -hmm. and i'm like all they cared about was the spring-loaded special features right i just wanted a land speeder that looked like a land speeder and these action figures you can't even call them that they're works of art they look exactly they're so well done and so lovingly crafted. I never have any complaints. So it's almost like being, every time you look at a hot toy figure, you're like, 
they were thinking about us. Somebody <laughs> finally said, we're going to make toys that look exactly like what you want them with to re- removable uh, magnetic heads that you magnetic can heads you can the change grimace their... or smile or it's something. amazing it and is. that's why i love them and i'm with you sam neill but i'm more, most excited about ben affleck's batman mm, movie yes. because as a filmmaker ben affleck has become i can't wait to see his new period crime oh, thriller. looks great live by night yeah. and live by night looks so good yeah. and then his new uh, the accountant yeah that looks great. <laughs> Accountant by day, assassin by night. Right. He's become he's a Batman villain in his right. new movie. Yeah, totally. I mean, how great is that? He's playing a Batman villain. Uh, they could bring the accountant into the Batman movie and team them up. Batman can take down the accountant. <laughs> right. uh, take down himself. But uh, you know, I, I, I think he's as a filmmaker, he's he's grown. This is his fourth feature mm-hmm. that he's directed, and his acting is always great too. And I, I've always been a big fan of Ben Affleck. And I think uh, I I actually like that Deathstroke is going to be fighting. Batman because it reminds me of this annual that came out that Michael Golden drew this Batman where he was fighting a mirror version of himself mm. and in many ways I can't remember what that character was called but he had a Batman type outfit and whatnot but in many ways Deathstroke is the mirror version of Batman and I think that's what's so cool is like you know to have someone on the other side that you have to fight against who has like a different moral code and you so it's going to be a very exciting uh you know, fight between them throughout the entire movie, but I also think they are going to have a giant chunk of it take place in Arkham, where we are going to get to see Batman, this new Batman's rogues gallery, like who is in Arkham. You're going to definitely, you're probably going to see the Joker, you're going to see Penguin, you're going to see Riddler, or my hopes, Scarecrow, it's at least the ver- the new cinematic version of these characters, even in cameos, it would totally work. So I'm, I have a lot of ho- high hopes for this Batman. It's a, it's a great, I mean, I love the video games. So Arkham Asylum is yeah. fantastic. So if they pull from that video game to make it a film, that's, I'm in. I'm yeah. definitely in. Well, you know, also, I mean, the great thing about Deathstroke is you can see Bruce Wayne and Slade Wilson going at it too. Yep. I yeah. want to, you know, I love the movie Wall Street which is now 30 years old, but there's sure. a great scene where Gordon Gecko goes up against Terrence Stamp's character. And he's like, Terrence Stamp's like, I'll break you, mate. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and mm-hmm. Terrence Stamp is like Deathstroke, yes. you know, in Wall Street. And Bruce Wayne is Gordon Gecko, but a good Gordon Gecko. Right. <laughs> and I would love to see them battling on the streets in character, but on Wall Street. Totally. As their real no, that would yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Definitely, ch- I'm gonna just throw out the limey if you've never seen it. Oh, but so good. Um, and it, the names, Wilson. That's right. In that movie. That's oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Um, let's go flashback Peter Fonda style since we're talking about the Limey. Um, we're into 300, 2006, saw the release of uh, another comic book film uh, from uh, writer, artist, legend Frank Miller. Uh, it's the 300 adaptation. This time it comes from a director, Zack Snyder, who had at the time directed the remake of Dawn of the Dead. So this is his big kind of next his biggest mm-hmm. film up to that point. And uh, he had not gone on to make a, let's uh, not even talk about Sucker Punch. He hadn't done that yet. So the graphic tale of 300 had all the notes that Miller had developed during Daredevil, Ronin, Dark Knight, and then Sin City. It was his intense artwork and terse storytelling that led this tale of the Spartans to the big screen in the first place. And Zack Snyder employed many of his own tools of the trade as a director with spectacular results. His ramped up speed to slow motion down compositions, it, it mimicked Miller's art. Uh, while bringing a hyper reality to the intense violence and gore, making a true heavy metal uh, music video sequence, sometimes in these action sequences, in all the best ways. Let's talk about 300. Let's start with you, Robert. Your thoughts about the movie 300? Well, you know, I'm, I'm really mixed on this movie. I mean, I, I really loved it when it came out. I thought it was great. <clears throat> but it's almost a literal adaptation mm. of the comic book as opposed to being a cinematic look. It's beautifully shot. But it's literally recreations of the comic panels. Mm-hmm. Now, that's kind of the point with this movie. Mm-hmm. Right. But I think that Zack Snyder then went way too far where he did the same thing with Watchmen and a lot of the essence of what Watchmen was was lost. Whereas a lot of this was... his Frank Miller's storytelling was so sparse in the book anyway, it was really all about the visuals. Mm-hmm. And, and seeing a recreation of the comic done cinematically, this was almost perfect mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know what they could have done to make it more so, but it is this incredible phantasmagoria of, it it has no historical accuracy at all, but it is a beautiful tone poem, and it is a great homage to Frank Miller's artwork and his panel design and and the the action and energy that's contained in his his artwork, but I don't know how I feel about it as a movie, Mm. Mm. as a film, as a piece of cinema. Mm. I don't know. 
Uh, David, what are your thoughts? I think it, it's one of those movies where the visuals, they just stay with you. And I can't say that about every film I've seen. Even some films I really love, like, I, I don't know, I'm thinking about Black Swan. I really enjoyed Black sure. Swan. I don't know if I could remember a lot of the scenes from Black Swan, though, but 300, those images are still in my head. I mean, the image with the kid, you know, no hunting doubt. the wolf and right. um, the scene with, with with the ships crashing together and Leonidas just standing there with his shield and, like, the wind and the rain is just, you know, all that. And it was all shot, you know, with blue or green screen in a studio, no outside shots at all. But I just love the visuals. You're right. It's light on storytelling. I don't, I don't know the story there, right. but the visuals are so incredible. And even in the sequel, Rise of the Empire, <clears throat> excuse me, I still enjoyed that, even though it wasn't as original as one. I'd never seen anything like that on screen before. Was yeah. that back in 06, 07? Uh, 2006. Oh, sorry. 2006, was, sorry. Yeah. yeah, and I was, like, I, I was in well, college I mean, at the time. I'd never seen Gerard anything Gerard like Butler, that. like, you know, his giant teeth. This is Sparta! Yeah. I mean, I remember that, but it's, of course, the action scenes is what really is the walk right. away with 300, and that is Zack Snyder putting kind of a, a cool visual stamp yep. onto, like, what we've now come to know as Zack Snyder's kind of directorial style, which is really burned in using... Frank Miller as a jumping off point. Now, I agree with you that it is like kind of a straight up comic book adaptation in a very similar way as Robert Rodriguez did Sin City, where you're taking Frank Miller's mm -hmm. artwork and compositions and using those compositionally as like living storyboards for yourself to then turn into a moving picture. Is it a film? Is it stand up as a film? I would say yes, it's not the greatest film ever made. That's what I mean. It's like the visuals are some of the greatest right. visuals ever made. As a movie, it's not the best movie ever made, but it's an entertaining film, especially in the world of comic book films. It's in the top 100. What were we going to say? But say I, you know, I <clears throat> Here's the thing about movies at least for me. I like the idea that the new trend in superhero films is to set superheroes in the real world. We've talked about it before like right. Tim Burton's Batman, I don't believe that Gotham exists other than in that movie. Right. Mm -hmm. Anton Furst's production designs all over the place. But Christopher Nolan shot his Batman movies on the streets of real cities. Yeah. You know, yes, he used visual effects trickery, but because he used so much practical, the, the superheroes lived in the real world. They lived in a world that I could believe that they might be outside my window right mm -hmm. now. Right. And that's what I love in cinema. And with movies like this, it's almost like you're, it's the middle ground between, as Rod Serling said, light and mm. shadow. It's, there's no, if there's no reality at all in the movie, am I watching a movie? Do I have to readjust my own beliefs in what cinema can be? Mm. Because I do like stylized movies. Like a movie like Amelie is completely, even though it takes place in the real world, completely stylized. And, and it's one of my favorite movies in the world. So why shouldn't I love this? Well, like, I mean, it's a, 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 one of the things you're saying is like, you Star Wars. The dirty down version mm -hmm. of the spaceships made it like, look, sure. it's like a, an auto p p a car park. That's the Millennium Falcon. It makes it it's grounded in a reality, even though it's all of it is not real. Right. So some of those things that we need, like I'd say Terry Gilliam in his older films was really good at grounding mm -hmm. things because everything had a worn look to it. Everything had a, a history and a past to it, like the objects around the people actually had a lived in feel. So that helps you feel like the rest of the movie is a reality that you can go into the journey with. So sometimes, I mean, I see your point though, but I think the real, the the world that they created in this, I felt like oh, I could live in this world for this moment of time. I don't know if I want to be like, you know, fighting people for the next 400, you know, movies or whatever. It had a very limited amount of time for it. And it, right. feel, it feels like a moving painting. You know, like yes. you're watching this art, this painting has just kind of come to life and just kind of starts flowing. And the, But I think it works because you're telling this, it's like telling a, 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 a like around the campfire, telling some incredible tale that's larger than life. And the only way that you can spew that, you know, imagination onto a page or an image is through something like this. You can't ground a story like that in the real world if you're telling right. Noah's Ark or, I even thought Noah like was too limited for the scope. I'm like, it just didn't feel, it didn't feel big. Like I imagined it if you read right. in the Bible or something like that, it needed to be bigger. It's larger than life. This is larger than life. but. I think I don't need to, like, if there was like a television series, even though I called out Spartacus, which mm -hmm. is a lot like this, which right. is I really enjoyed, I don't know if I need to watch this every day, but every now and then to see that, those kind of types of images are so sure. impactful. It was refreshing. Yeah. Yeah. See, that, I would totally agree with you there. I completely agree because for the movie, it worked. Yeah. And the idea of 300 Spartans taking on 10,000 Persians, you know, right. that seems larger than life anyway. Like, mm -hmm. how could that right. happen? So <laughs> and not even this. just Persians, weird demagogues and like the strange, immortals, yeah, right, 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 what, immortals, strange yeah. super, yeah. you know, a lot of weird craziness. Mm -hmm. 
All right, let's move on. We got this week's spotlight is uh, something we're trying out here at Collider Video, um, and we want to just give you a little preview. Uh, this is up right now on our Collider Video channel, and right now it's just uh, it's called Who Is Mr. Sinister, but we're calling these Collider Originals. We don't have an exact title for them yet, um, but check out this little preview short, and we'll come right back. Who is Mr. Sinister? <laughs> hey, guys, I'm John Schnapp, and it's time to get to know Mr. Sinister. Mr. Sinister has tormented the X-Men for decades. The character was originally created by comic book legend Chris Claremont and artist Mark Silvestri during an event dubbed the Mutant Massacre in Uncanny X-Men number 221 in 1987. In this storyline, Sinister hired a band of mercenaries called the Marauders to eradicate a number of mutants living in the sewers. What's up, Caliban? For a long time, Sinister's origin was a mystery, but his beginnings were revealed as those of Nathaniel Essex, a biologist in London in 1859. As Essex worked closely with the theories of Charles Darwin, he was approached by the ex-villain Apocalypse and was charged with creating a virus that would kill the weak of the world. Nathaniel struggled with the decision as he had a wife and unborn child to look after, but having worked with Apocalypse on other ventures, his wife grew to hate him and eventually died in childbirth. Before dying, Rachel Essex called her husband Sinister, and thus Apocalypse took his chance and offered to make Nathaniel immortal. All right, so if you like that, you like that little preview, there's a lot more of it. Um, just go to the Collider video and check it out, watch it, share it with your friends, uh, comment on it, tell other people to watch it, and uh, let us know uh, what your thoughts are. And if you have some suggestions for other Collider originals, we're gonna cover the gamut from comic book heroes, Star Wars, TV, and movies. So we're gonna do the whole thing. We're gonna launch this off and uh, happy to, to start this uh, brand new series off. So definitely let us know what your thoughts are on it and share it with all your friends. So we're gonna launch into the Twitter questions next, uh, starting off with Tuamas Limata asking, with the deal between Marvel and Sony, can Marvel use Spider-Man characters in the Netflix series? I need Venom. Well, um, as far as, I, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, no. I'm just gonna say probably not. I think the deal is specifically with Disney and Marvel movies, the cinematic movies. I mean, look, we got Spider-Man and Captain America Civil War. That's our very first taste of the brand new Marvel Spider-Man. Now we're getting Spider-Man Homecoming, which is gonna be introducing the Marvel Cinematic Universe version of Spider-Man. He's in high school. Um, we know he's going to be fighting the Vulture and the Shocker, and who else knows? You know, maybe the Tinkerer's involved. We don't know how many other villains are in it. Um, Venom's probably going to be a little ways off, is my guess. And when it comes out, it's going to be a Sony movie, and he's going to be involved in the Spider-Man cinematic universe. What are your thoughts, Dave? We'll start with you. Uh, again, I'm no lawyer either, but uh, if this were to happen, there's a story out there. Because please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if Mark Wade wrote it, but it is a story where it's Daredevil, Captain America. No, no sorry. Daredevil, Captain America, and Spider-Man, and I want to say, or maybe the Punisher's in there too, and they're kind of like trying to work out the different ways of fighting crime and all that. And I, I'd love to see that in the Netflix universe if they do do something like that. Also, if they do Venom, first of all, I'd love to see Rick Remender's version mm. of Venom. You know, the ex-military guy lost his legs. He uses the Venom suit, you know, to do uh, hopefully do some good. I would love to see Rick Remender's version. Sure. You know, with the Tony Moore art and all that, I'd love to see that version. Uh, he's just such a great writer. It's yeah, like he's, he's you know, if you haven't checked out Black Science and all these other things he's been writing, mm -hmm. it's great. So, well, I, I think it's amazing how we were able to see corporate synergy the way we've never seen before by Sony getting together with Marvel and allowing Spider-Man. Now it's like, well, now that that's happened, can we just have everything? <laughs> I know, but and I'm, this is not a diss at all, but but it's it's like asking for a minor character, and and Venom has become okay a fan favorite, but. But that's something I think Sony would say, oh, guys, uh, you're pushing it, you yeah. know? So I don't expect to see, especially in a Netflix show, hey, it'd be really cool, I guess. Um, I think to explain that Venom is actually an alien symbiote they found during the Secret Wars, you know, might be a little hard to, <laughs> hard to, sure. hard to explain in the Netflix Hell's Kitchen verse. Mm -hmm. right. right. But who knows? Yeah. Can't wait for that Luke Cage show this weekend. Yeah, personally, yeah, I would like to have any of the, like, magical or super-powered characters, like, stay out of the Netflix universe, yeah. and I'd love to just see. I mean, obviously, we're going to be dealing with, you know, Elektra and the Hand and, like, Super Ninjas and stuff and the Defenders, and we're going to have Iron Fist. So there's going to be some magical elements to it, but uh, I don't want to see Venom and all these other characters in the Netflix universe. Mm -hmm. I think 
think that Venom deserves to be in the Spider-Man world. And maybe if they do do, I don't know when they're going to do Avengers Secret Wars, but I can see that happening. So maybe that would be a perfect time to do a, a relaunch or phase four or whatever they're going to be doing. So um, let's move on to the next question. Jonathan G. Ross asks, can Infinity War be 70% stand-ins and VFX to put together a lot of actors filmed separately? Scheduling is hard. Now, uh, Robert had answered this a little bit earlier as far as like, yes, a lot of Civil War. They were able to shoot, you know, people like talking to green dots and this and that. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, we all know that Robert Downey Jr. doesn't wear that suit anymore. That's a, an all CG Iron Man suit, which is sometimes hard to fathom when you watch the movie. You're like, none of that's real. And you're like, you see the offset, you know, the ons, the, the real picture. He's just wearing a weird green kind of thing. You're like, or like, you know, that weird stitched up like gray and X'd out suit and stuff. Mm -hmm. You're like, technology is freakishly amazing and crazy and yeah. scary. <clears throat> and we're at that weird, like, you know, uncanny valley moment where like, we're about to be crossing over the uncanny valley where it's like, if you don't know what that is, that's when you can't tell what's real or what's fake. And it's like, if a human being is talking to another human being and one of them is fake and you can't tell, that is the official uncanny valley mm -hmm. destruction. The valley is exploded, it's on fire. <laughs> we don't know what's happening anymore, what's real. But uh, I kind of think that when Doctor Strange is gonna be with the Avengers, they're gonna use a practical set and they're gonna let them all interact with each other because that's what's so cool about having really good actors is them reacting to each other and not talking to a green orb. And that's where that's where true acting really kind of comes together. We've heard all the stories about Ian McKellen having a yeah. meltdown <clears throat> at the, on the latest Hobbit because he's in a room for like four days talking to green He almost dot. left. Yeah. But I totally understand where he's coming from because it's like he didn't sign up for this shit. Is basically when actors are like, sit in this box and talk to a square, you're like, what? Mm -hmm. Actors need to react in order to act. And it's like, it's so important. So I'm very happy that I know the Russo brothers have had many practical scenes as well as CG scenes. When it comes to action, let's bring in the green screen. That totally makes right. sense. When it comes to acting, build a set. That's my feelings. What are your thoughts, David? Yeah, there's, and there's too much money on the table. I know he's saying here that Paul's like saying, or um, Jonathan's saying scheduling's hard, but right. it's like there's too much money on the table. They will make this schedule work. You know, yeah. even Benedict Cumberbatch is worried like, how are they going to get our schedules together? I, I got to shoot the next season of Sherlock or Robert Downey Jr. has this going on. It's like they will make it happen. Right. This is going to be their biggest payday that they're going to receive. Right. So they will come together and make all this work. It's being shot. All of it is being shot in IMAX. Right. So let's keep repeating that. These guys are, are so thought? talented, these actors. That they, yeah. Of course they can pull it off. They're going to yeah. be able to do it. Well, it's, it's also going to be probably the biggest, the most, at least the most expensive movie ever made. I mean, right. a lot mm -hmm. of, they're not going to be building the kind of sets or the vistas that they built in the first Star Wars movie, right. or mm -hmm. even when J.J. Abrams came back and did a lot practical, a lot of it's going to be on a green screen out of necessity, simply because of the vistas they're going to be showing mm -hmm. us. But still, like you said, one of the great things, Age of Ultron, it's that scene at dinner, the party in uh, the Avengers Tower. I mean, that's what we want to see. We love those characters sitting around, <laughs> even in, in uh, Civil War, when they're sitting around talking to Thunderbolt, you know, it's it's the, you want to see them even if they're sitting at a table talking. Mm -hmm. You just want to see those actors together, right. in the same frame. And I think we're going to see that because I mean the Russo brothers also like that, so right. we're going to see that. Um, next question: Paul Byrne asks, British comic 2000 AD celebrates 2000 issues this week. Do you have any favorite moments from the comic run? So. Um, let's talk about uh, 2000 AD. If you're not familiar with it, it's a uh, comic from England that came out and is still being published. Um, my familiarity with it uh, really comes from uh, some of the Judge Dredd issues and then a lot of the Alan Moore stuff like Marvel Man and uh, the V for Vendetta. So those are some of the earlier issues that I would kind of, I searched down was I found a couple of those Marvel Man issues when they started publishing it here as Miracle Man. That's when I was like, oh, I got to get those 2000 AD comics. And then I got turned on to all these other crazy artists and writers in the 2000 AD catalog. Mm -hmm. Robert, how about you? Well, I, you know, again, I, I discovered 2000 AD in the old Eagle comics when mm. Eagle comics from the early 80s was reprinting all the Judge Dredd stuff. And I love the Judge Dredd thing. Right. But from those early days, my favorite thing that was in 2000 AD was Alan Moore and Alan Davis's DR and Quinch. Mm. And DR and Quinch were, I mean, they're, they're stoner. It's Cheech and Chong in space. It's an alien Cheech and Chong, basically who are amoral it's it's beavis and butthead cheech and chong think about your favorite uh, duos who just get into trouble and and like i remember there was a cover there was a cover of of dr and quench they're deciding like whether or not they're going to join the military and there's just this panel where they're standing in a room full of like the most amazing 
exotic weapons ever. And one of them says, wow, like a vast array of totally like lethal weapons. And the other one says, we'll join, man. You know, and it was just that kind of stuff. It was Stripes, you know, right. it, was, it was Harold Ramis and, and, and Bill Murray and Stripes. And I loved it. Nice. I love the Arn Quinch. How about you, dude? So I wasn't familiar with this year. I didn't know that was part of V for Vendetta. Mm -hmm. That's probably one of my favorite Alan Moore stories. I mean, I actually, it was blasphemous to say, I apologize. I actually prefer V for Vendetta over Watchmen. If I had to read something back to back, I, I love V for Vendetta. I love the, the prose, you know, amazing. the dialogue. It's yeah. just so, so well written. But I had no idea. I was trying to look it up. Like I said, on the Comixology of the app last night, trying right. to read some, but I just couldn't find any. But you said you can find some in the dollar bins. Yeah, and, I mean, 2000 AD, a lot <laughs> of the back issues are very inexpensive. So definitely give yourself a chance. Go to a comic book store around you that has a back issue bin mm -hmm. and ask them about 2000 AD. And I'm sure they've got a couple of those magazines floating around. It's a bigger slightly bigger since so magazine sized comics so. wasn't hmm. strontium dog it was 2008 strontium, like strontium dog that's right too. you know i don't think they've adapted strontium dog yet into no. a movie we should strontium make that dog. we should definitely do that at some point in, in the spotlight universe um last is a sweaty question of the week we've got mr undecillion finally here we are mr undecillion um which super villain would you say is the lamest character that could use a huge makeover to make him her badass so what super villain pops out to you <laughs> so i do a little research right there's a, i think this would be perfect for either arrow or flash you know, maybe even supergirl called the fiddler and the Fiddler uh, is from, uh, let's see, I have it right here, 1948. The first appearance in All Flash, number 32. And it's a, it's a character that gets his magical powers from playing the fiddle. Right. And he looks ridiculous, kind of looks like a leprechaun, a little bit, a crazy character. I think one of those characters, I know Mark Hamill uh, already has the character that he plays, um, but I feel like Mark Hamill, if he could like come back and do this role, I think he'd be great. And some wacky older guy, just really mad loopy. fiddler, mad Fiddlin. fiddler, and he gets his magical powers from the fiddle. So I would love to see him in one of the uh, uh, DC but shows man, on the CW. I, I would just think the fiddler crab. He like he's like got us like a fiddler crab logo. He's like I'm a fiddler. I don't I'm know. I'm amazed about how many villains there are. You look up on lists on them. There's so many <clears> villains <throat> I've never even heard of before. Right, well, super lame villains. Yeah, super lame yeah. villains. Exactly. You know, I, I like the idea of the fiddler. It's like the Charlie Daniels song. <laughs> when when the right uh, he was playing on the sewing on the fiddle and playing it hot and the devil jumped on it. Here some said, "Boy, let me tell you what. I guess you you know that sure. the fiddler against the devil or he a, a devilish fiddler. Why not? <laughs> you got a lame villain? I have a lame villain. I'm a huge X Men fan. All right, and I think perhaps one of the dumbest characters ever created is the Sugar Man. Yes, the Sugar Man agree. that was that we first saw in Age of Apocalypse. I have joked with Brian Singer about this. About, I, I think he even had a Sugar Man figure on his desk There's for a, a while. <laughs> and I, that is, if, if somebody could figure out a way to bring the Sugar Man, yeah, I mean, four, four arms, that could be cool. Right. He's kind of like Modoc. I was going to say, he's, he's like Modoc's brother. He's like like Modoc's kind of like, let's not talk about him. He's in the corner. Like, if there's you any know. way, look, James Gunn can bring back Howard the Duck after the debacle right. of the Howard 1986 mm -hmm. movie. Somebody, I defy them. I defy them to bring back <laughs> Sugar Man and make Sugar Man work in the well, cinematic I've got world. A lame, I've got a lame villain for you. It's Mr. Mitzel Plitik. <laughs> uh, I don't even know if I'm saying it right. I've been corrected a million times. Mr. Mit, Mr. Mitzel Plitik. It's a Superman villain. Some weird orange kind of like tiny dude with a big pot belly. Uh, <laughs> uh, wearing a, a little bowler cap. His outfit is stupid as well. Um, but he's like from another dimension. He's got infinite wizard powers. He can do anything. He can like change, you know, like turn you inside out. He can make, you know, he's a very scary character, but he's always causes problems for Superman. And he has to somehow, Superman has to trick him into saying his name backwards. So this stuff has to go away. This entirely has to get rewritten. That saying your name backwards thing, I know it's kind of cute, was interesting in the like late 40s, early 50s when this character popped up somewhere. He's like, he's sort of like the impossible he's man. He's a magic wielder. Yeah, but he's like the impossible <laughs> man from the Fantastic Four where you have a character who is like infinitely pow powerful and annoying impossible and man. stupid. So it's like, <laughs> so Alan Moore did a great job at making Mr. Mitzelplitik incredibly scary and you know the last the last superman story before mm -hmm. they did the john byrne revamp where it's basically mr mitzelplitik was like revealed himself do you think this is my true form and then you, you show him as like this weird crazy demon is <laughs> this is what i really look like you know i've been playing this game with you all well i would say just never have that original form in there in the first place where he's <laughs> like hey what's up guys with a weird bowler cap and just make him a creepy <laughs> demon called mitzelplitik don't add get rid of the mister 
He's from another dimension. He doesn't need a you mister. He's a mailing address. Yeah, he doesn't really need that. <laughs> are you a mister or missus? It's a, what are you? It's like, just call me mister. Nope. Yep. <laughs> if he says mister, he should disappear. It should just be mitzelplitic. And make him demonic and creepy and scary and depower him a little bit. Because right now, he's corny and lame. I'm sorry if you love if he's your favorite character. But uh, he, needs a, he needs a redo. He needs to go into the hair salon and get like a brand new, you know. Get brand new suit, powers, rewrite. Somebody get on it. So. Christopher Lloyd could play that. Mm. He would be a you know, good a tall one with oh, the yeah. hair. Mm. You know, I would he's love older to, now and, and make him just, demonic. He just did a I Am Not a Serial Killer, the movie that Christopher Lloyd is in. Definitely check that out. Mm. He's definitely creepy in it. Um, anyway, thank you guys for watching, guys and gals. Uh, this has uh, been a great episode. Where can people find you online, Robert? Uh, as always, you can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett or Twitter at Burnett RM and keep sending me those hot toys pictures because i do love them and also on facebook at robert meyer burnett right on and uh, david where can people find you you can find me on instagram and twitter at griffin de as well as here every monday with collider tv talk also don't forget uh christian harloff john campy myself for re reviewing star wars rebels season three every episode look for those on saturday night oh awesome. we should mention what's that we have something coming up for the fans don't you and i oh yeah we've got a schmodown uh where me and robert actually have teamed up as team heroes and uh, awesome. it'll be on next week, and I believe we are fighting the uh, Wolves of Steel. Is Wolves that what they're Steel. called? Yeah, it's uh, Mark Riley and Clark Wolf. Uh, it's a power team. That is a powerful team. Wow. So uh, we're bringing our heroes' knowledge. Hopefully, uh, we're going to rock it out. So check it out. It's a schmodown that's happening next week. And also what's happening next week is uh, New York Comic Con. So uh, I'm going to be out there. I've got a booth, booth 309. Uh, and on Thursday, the very first day of uh, the New York Comic Con, we are doing a Thursday Live Heroes panel. Uh, me, uh, Jason Inman, Ashley V. Robinson, hopefully Robert Meyer Burnett will all be out there uh, doing a Live Heroes panel. So bring your sweaty questions. It's going to give you a sweaty time. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, then come by my booth. I've got a couple of brand new crazy things. I'm launching this crazy statue, which I'll reveal next week. Uh, I'll have pre-orders available there. And uh, just it's going to be a lot of fun. New York Comic Con is going to be a blast. So look forward to seeing you there. And uh, I'll see you next week on uh, Heroes uh, 77. Take care. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.